What's going on, folks? Ted from Nerd Immersion here, and it's not Tuesday, obviously, and we're probably, at least by the time I finish this video, going to be into Thursday, which is American Thanksgiving. So to my fellow Americans out there, happy Thanksgiving. Uh, but we're going to be talking about the top 10 magic items for the Rogue. So I wanted to get this one done before I let this whole week slip by and it got away from me. Uh, I know we're in the midst of Dragonlance coverage and some other things, but top 10 magic items for the Rogue coming up here. If you want to see the specifics, stay tuned. All right, so uh, first, hey, look, 99.8, and this is actually very much closer to 99.9K .9 as the number goes up here. So if you haven't subscribed to the channel and you like the variety of different coverage and things I do here, please consider subscribing. That being said, let's talk about the specifics for this video. It's nothing new. You've heard me talk about it ad nauseum at this point, but I have to do it in case this is the first time watching. And if it is, welcome. I'm glad to have you here. So what are the specifics? How are we handling this? We are only going to be talking about up to very rare magic items, as in we're not covering legendary uh, items, artifacts, things of that nature. So, you know, common, uncommon, rare, and very rare magic items. We are not going to be talking about any consumable magic items, whether that be potions or scrolls or thing with, this, uh, with a limited number of charges that don't recharge after a long rest, something like the Chime of Opening, which has so many charges, and when it's expended, it is then gone forever. So we won't be talking about those either. Uh, we're also not going to be talking about any of the manuals or tomes that boost any of your ability scores by two if you read them over that certain period of time, because those are useful for everybody. And lastly, we are not going to be talking about anything specific to a subclass. I know that certain subclasses within the Rogue have abilities that allow them to possibly use other magic items like the Thief or other things that are specific like, oh, this would be really good for a Gloom Stalker. This would be really good for a Scout. We're not talking about that. We want this to be a subclass agnostic video. So no matter what kind of rogue you're playing, this will be beneficial for you. Also, lastly, you should pair this video with the first video I released in the kicking off of this 2022 version of the classes, which is top 10 magic items for all classes. Take these 10 plus those 10. Again, attunement won't allow you to take all of them, but consider both of those when you're looking at a list if your dm lets you pick or asks for what items you're looking for find what combination of those works for you let's dive in number 10 the eyes of minute seeing this uncommon non-attunement magic item comes to us from the basic rules and i think it just fits what most people consider a rogue to do and that is sort of the investigation type who might be picking locks or disarming traps because it says while wearing them you can see much better than normal out to a range of one foot meaning 12 inches from your face you have advantage on investigation checks that rely on sight while searching an area or studying an object in that range more often than not if you're within one foot that's probably where you're at to possibly pick a lock possibly to uh, disarm a trap you're in that close proximity as well as just generally searching around the room and maybe it's not in your campaigns but in my campaigns most rogues take investigation as a skill not saying that others like wizards and things can't but i feel like 90 percent of the time and again this is my personal experience other classes take perception not saying that the rogue doesn't take perception but they usually also have investigation as well so having advantage on investigation checks even if it requires that close proximity seems like a good thing for you to have and hey it's not attunement Number nine, the Bracers of Archery. These uncommon attunement magic bracers come to us from the basic rules. And while wearing them, probably one of the more important things is it does give you proficiency with the longbow and the shortbow. You will have proficiency with the shortbow as a rogue normally, but you won't unless the ra you have a race that specifically gives, it ac gives you access or a feed or a multi-class. But normally you don't have access to the longbow, and it is one of the best, most high damage, long range weapons out there. So the longbow is pretty great to have. And if that wasn't enough, it also gives you a plus two bonus to damage made with either longbows or shortbows. 
So again, if you find yourself being a more ranged rogue or one that engages in ranged combat occasionally, having a plus two damage to your longbow and shortbow attacks are great. And again, it also gives you access to the longbow, which might open up some new options for things that you, you know, whether you find a longbow in game and can't use it or whatever the case may be. Number eight. The Hat of Disguise. This uncommon attunement magic item comes to us from the basic rules. And while wearing it, you can use an action to cast the Disguise Self spell on yourself at will. And that spell ends if the hat is removed. Disguise Self is a very useful spell. And not stereotyping all rogues here. But more often than not, in the games I've played with, similar in a vein to what a lot of people think of the Bard, the rogue seems to find themselves in a situation where they may be on the run, whether that be from the law or, or what have you. So the ability to change your shape and form at will is quite useful. And typically, rogues aren't going to have access to spells more often than not. Some might through, again multi-classing or races or things like that but being able to disguise yourself is quite useful uh or perhaps it's not even that you're on the run from the law or whatnot but you're going to sneak into a place to steal something and it's much better to wear somebody else's face if you get caught than your own and it kind of helps dissociate you from it the only downside is it is still disguise self so it is illusion right so it's gonna you know, you can make yourself taller or slightly shorter, but if people actually interact with you, it will, you know, it'll break the illusion or they'll at least be made aware that it is an illusion. If someone takes your hat off, uh, then it will be removed. You can also remember that you can make your illusion not wear a hat, so you don't have to have that. Uh, so there's a lot of benefits to it. Uh, the only downside is you likely won't have a great spell save DC. Uh, and this is something I always keep forgetting. Maybe one of you can remind me in the comments. What is the spell save DC for Hat of Disguise to figure out what your, um, what, you know, how hard it is to break through your illusion if you don't have a spell save DC? I know there's a, there's a spot in one of the books that explains it, but if you let me know in the comments, that would be great because it's one I always seem to forget. Number seven. Glamoured studded leather armor. Now, again, in a similar vein to what we just spoke about with the Hat of Disguise, one, there's just not a lot of great, unique magic leather or studded leather armor in the game. More often than not, unless you have access to medium armor from some other source, you are going to be limited to leather armor. So studded leather armor is likely going to be what you use because it's the best option you have in the light armor range. And it gives you a plus one bonus to AC beyond that. So you're starting at 13 plus your dexterity modifier. And it also has the nice benefit that you can use a bonus action to speak the command word of the armor and cause the armor to assume the appearance of a normal set of clothing or some other kind of armor. You decide what it looks like, including color, style, and accessories, but the armor may, uh, retains its bulk and weight. Again, it still feels like studded leather armor to somebody who physically touches it, but it is illusory. It says the illusory appearance lasts until you use this property again or remove the armor. Again, in a similar vein to the Hat of Disguise, if you do decide you want to wear your own face into a scenario, but you don't want to make it look like you're prepped for battle, you can make it look like you're just wearing general, you know, whatever kind of adventuring clothes you would wear or perhaps make it look like some other heavier armor maybe you make it look like you know a breastplate or scale mail chain mail even and people might not think that you're a rogue because you're wearing this heavy armor and they may think of you as less of a threat potentially it has a lot of options there and then again if you were to say pair this with the hat of disguise i should also point out this is non-attunement so it is not only plus one leather or studded leather armor, but it also has this cool magical effect for no attunement. So, I mean, if I had to pick between this and the Hat of Disguise, I'm going to pick the Glamoured Studded Leather Armor every time. Number six. Cloak of Arachnida. This very rare attunement magic item comes to us from the basic rules as well. 
And there are a lot of really interesting cloaks that I think could be useful uh, in this sort of vein for the rogue. I think the robe of eyes is another one. But this one, I think, has a lot of themes that fit with the rogue. For example, right, you have po uh, resistance to poison damage, potentially useful so you don't accidentally poison yourself. You have a climbing speed equal to your walking speed, which is useful because not everybody's going to have that climb speed like the thief does. But it also gives you a basically spider climb where you can move up, down, and across vertical surfaces. So you essentially have Spider-Man capabilities to walk along a ceiling or what have you. Also, it leaves your hands free so you can do whatever you need to do. You can't be caught in, in webs of any kind and can move through webs as if they were difficult terrain, whether you're dealing with stuff in the Underdark or what have you, or the fact that you can cast the web spell uh, with a save DC of 13, which is fine, but you also can create your the web that you create. Normally, a web spell fills a 20-foot cube. Your web spell fills a 40-foot cube. Uh, it is only once until the next dawn that you can use this ability, but you can potentially drop a web on a 40-foot cube area, and then you can move through it as if it was difficult terrain. Uh, while as other people will potentially get stuck or what have you, it's a good escape tool. It could also be a good means to like scale the side of a building by putting up a web, and then you can just climb it. Obviously, you can walk on walls, but this also maybe deter other folks. There's a lot of options for it, and I just think it really fits the rogue aesthetic overall. Number five. The Bracer of Flying Daggers. This rare attunement magic item comes to us from Waterdeep Dragon Heist, and it belongs to one of my favorite characters, and that is Jarlaxle. So this is an armband that has thin little dagger strapped to it, and as an action, you can pull out two magic daggers and hurl them immediately, making a ranged attack with each dagger. It vanishes if you don't hurl it right away, and they disappear after they hit or miss and it never runs out of daggers. Now one, these are magically created daggers, so they will overcome anything that has magical resistance. They don't have any bonus to attack or damage, so that could be a fun thing. Maybe your DM will let you quest for the ability to enchant these further. But normally, as a rogue, you will only have one attack. You might have two if you dual wield and you have an attack, you know, an action and a bonus action. But as we all know, rogues have a lot of great options for their bonus action. But this gives you two, an action, two thrown attacks with two daggers that are both magic and both will still add your full dexterity modifier to the damage. And it still leaves your movement and your bonus action free. I think this is very fitting for a rogue. I think it's really cool, and if I ever get to play the game where I'm playing a rogue again, even though we've only played twice, I'd love to get these for my character in that game. Number four. The Dagger of Blindsight. This rare attunement magic item comes to us from Waterdeep Dungeon of the Mad Mage, and it's just a really useful item overall. I think it fits on a rogue, especially if you aren't gonna play till much later levels. Or you're going to be playing the 1 D&D version of the rogue and not have access to blindsight anymore. But a uh, creature that is attuned to this gets blindsight out to 30 feet. And it, then it has some little, it says the dagger has a sawtooth edge and a black pearl nest in its pommel. Uh, it is a rare attunement magic item, but it is a magic item, so it still overcomes damage resistance. And nowhere does it say you need to be wielding the dagger or using the dagger to gain access to the blindsight. You just need to have it and be attuned to it. So you could have this dagger attuned to it and leave it in your backpack and fight with a rapier or a bow, and then you'd still have the benefit of 30 feet of blindsight. 30 feet is a lot. Most player character options that get you blindsight have pretty limited ranges, somewhere in usually the 10 to 15 foot range. This is pretty big, and it's for a just one attunement slot. I really like this. I think I might end up just using the dagger anyway because it's cool, or if I had it, I'd stow it and use the bracers of flying daggers if I could. Number three. Gloves of Thievery. You knew these had to be on here because they are probably one of the most quintessential or best magic items for a rogue out there. They are uncommon. They come to us from the Dungeon Master's Guide, and they are non-attunement. They also, when donned by you, become completely invisible, so nobody can see that you're wearing said gloves, and they give you a plus five bonus to your dexterity sleight of hand checks and dexterity checks made to pick locks. Two of the things you will, at least one of those, right, potentially picking locks 
and more than likely probably sleight of hand checks are things you as a rogue will more than likely be asked to do one time if not multiple times if not yourself initiating these things to pickpocket people or what have you and having a just static plus five bonus to these things is huge reminder that this could be on top of things like expertise in the given skill as well as a high dexterity and then you're going to just tack on plus five on top of that that's pretty huge and it's from a non-attunement magic item that can't be physically seen by anybody as they are invisible they're really awesome and any rogue and realistically these are useful for just about anybody because even if you're not someone who picks locks regularly having a plus five bonus might make you good at it but they really shine when they're given to a rogue number two the Ghost Step Tattoo, a very rare attunement magic item that comes to us from Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, and it is also very useful for a rogue because it has a lot of great synergies. So it has three charges and it gets all three back daily at dawn. As a bonus action, while this tattoo is on your skin, you can expend one of the charges to become incorporeal uh, until the end of your next turn, and it provides you with the following three benefits. You have resistance to bludgeoning, piercing, slashing damage from non-magical attacks. That is very useful, and I will also remind you that resistance stacks with things like Uncanny Dodge. Uncanny Dodge just says you use this as a reaction to when you take damage, and you have that damage. It does not say you have resistance to that damage, so therefore having resistance to bludgeoning, piercing, slashing damage, if you were to suffer an attack that did slashing damage, with this activated, if it was prior, you'd have resistance to that damage, and then you could still use Uncanny Dodge to have that damage even further. You can't be grappled or restrained. This takes the idea of the slippery rogue to another level, where you could basically, no one can grab onto you or hold you in place, and it doesn't have any restrictions, right? It's not grappling via magic or restrained via magic. This is whatever any kind of grapple or restrain whether it be from a magical spell someone physically trying to grab you difficult terrain vines what have whatever it is you can just slip by these bonds completely and probably one of the most beneficial options for the rogue the third bullet you can move through creatures and solid objects as if they were difficult terrain if you end your turn in a solid object you take a d10 force damage if the effect ends while you are inside a solid object, reminder this only lasts for uh, until the end of your next turn, rather. Uh, if the effect ends while you are inside a solid object, you instead are shunted to the nearby uh, nearest unoccupied space and take a D10 force damage for every five feet you travel. I really like this because, again, as a rogue, you usually have so many different options for moving. Once this is up, you have your bonus action for dashes and, and things like that. So you could potentially just sneak yourself into the vault if, you know, you find yourself in a vault situation by literally walking through the solid objects. And as long as you don't end your turn inside that object, you take no damage whatsoever. I think this is a very strong and probably one of the best tattoo options for the rogue out there. Number one. And lastly, we have the Kaganesti Forest Shroud. This rare attunement magic item actually comes to us from the newest book we have, Dragonlance Shadow of the Dragon Queen, and it is absolutely one of the best magic items out there for rogues, hands down. That's why it's number one here. This cloak appears to be made of autumnal leaves. You can see it right here. While you wear this cloak, you have advantage on stealth checks, period. No qualifier, just flat out advantage on stealth checks. And you can use a bonus action to magically teleport along with any equipment you are wearing or carrying to an unoccupied space within 30 feet. So flat out advantage on stealth checks all the time and you can bonus action teleport. If that wasn't enough, you have advantage on the next attack roll you make before the end of the turn. Once this bonus action is used, it can't be used until the next dawn. So the ability to just have flat out advantage on stealth checks with nothing, no qualifiers on it is an always on thing. And if you choose to use the bonus action teleport, which is a nice thing to have to get yourself 30 feet away, the next attack you have has advantage, allowing you to basically self-initiate sneak attack all through the use of one rare magic item. I think it's pretty awesome. It's also one of the only magic items in the Dragonlance book that actually gets art, which looks pretty good. And I think this would be a fantastic item on, obviously, a ranger. Had we had this last week, I would have put it here. Uh, but it's a great option for a rogue. I'd love to have this on a scout rogue. I think that's very thematic. But all in all, it's pretty awesome. Uh, and, but it's definitely not worth, I feel like, 
getting Dragon Lance just for this, but if you have the magic item or access to it, it's definitely one of the best magic items out there for a rogue. So there you go, folks. That is my top 10 magic items for the rogue. Normally next week, we'd be back with the top 10 magic items for the sorcerer, but I'm actually going to take a break from doing that so that I can give you a top 10 uh, holiday kind of shopping list thing. I'm probably going to be doing a couple of these between now and the end of the year, but I wanted to wait because as if it were, if I were to continue on this, I'd have sorcerer, warlock, and wizard. So I'd be giving you potentially a top 10 magic guide or top 10 like ideas for buying, you know, D&D holiday ideas, gift guide on the 20th of December, five days before the holiday, the major holiday anyway, uh, of Christmas. And I feel like five days doesn't really give you a whole lot of time to shop. So I'd rather give it to you uh, on the 29th of November. So you have plenty of time to plan out whatever holiday you celebrate that you'll have enough time to purchase these gifts, whether they have a long lead time or you just need to make sure you have an idea and save up or whatever it is. So anyway, folks, I wanted to thank you all so much for watching. Thank you to everybody who's continued to subscribe to the channel and drives that number up. It seems like the possibility of hitting 100K by the end of next week seems like a thing that might happen. And I really didn't think we'd get there, but you guys are just surprising me day in and day out over here. So thank you again to my patrons over on Patreon for continuing to support me and the channel. And we'll see you all next time.